You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Danal Mangestu, author of All Our Names, his latest work, which was published in March by Knopf. Um, I'll give you Denal's introduction, which he must have heard about not 100 times by now. <laughs> he was born in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in 1978. But in 1980, he came to the United States with his mom and his sister to reunite with his dad, who had fled the Communist Revolution two years before. Uh, Denal graduated from Georgetown and then got his uh, MFA from Columbia. Uh, he received a 2006 fellowship in fiction from the New York Foundation for the Arts. His first novel was The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, was a New York Times notable and awarded the uh, Guardian First uh, Book Award. And his second book was uh, How to Read the Air, which was published in 2010. And he lives in Paris, I think. <laughs> uh, no, actually, in New York right now. Okay, because <laughs> I, I couldn't tell from the... That's what it says on the uh, book jacket. Yeah. Anyway, uh, um, All Our Names is a book about two men who forge a bond a bond that is both uh, beautiful and at times horrific, and about a man and a woman who form a similar bond that is beautiful and at times, and I don't know what the word is. Um, it's also a tale of immigration, moving from one country to another. But in this case, the idea of immigration is not that the true measure or the genreization of this new wave of si fiction. So enough about Enough of me pontificating like I always do. So we actually have the author here. Welcome, Denal, and thanks so much for joining us today on The Avid Reader. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me what I said wrong in the synopsis and, and tell our listeners a little bit about the book. Um, oh, I, everything in the synopsis was, was pretty much right on, except um, recently I, I returned from Paris and, and have come back to New York. And um, other than that, you were pretty much spot on. Um, and, and I think your summation of the novels is, is fairly accurate. Um, it's very much a portrait of of two different um, relationships, both of which are, are sort of centered and based on a profound love and affection, and at the same time, two relationships that are um, forced to undergo a series of crises, one in Africa because of the politics um, surrounding these two young men, and the one that happens in the United States um, because of the racial discrimination, because of the complexity of trying to translate your experiences to someone who has never gone through those stories before. Well, you know, I've listened to, you know, your, your interview at The Strand and a couple of other ones, and it's not that you seem sensitive about the idea of, hey, this is just another immigration novel, but like in the past four weeks, I interviewed Laura Vopner, uh, she wrote The Scent of Pine, which is immigration yeah. from, I interviewed Gary on Little Failure. Mm -hmm. By the way, I love that mockumentary about his blurbing, <laughs> yeah. which he was doing as late as yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, then I interviewed Akhil Sharma on Family Life. Um, yeah. So you're the fourth in four weeks that deal with immigration from either India or uh, Russia um, uh, and, and now Africa. So um, tell, me about, tell me about how you feel about this, because I didn't look at it. I never looked at it as, about, uh, as a book about immigration, ever, not in one page. Yeah, no, and and I don't. Sometimes I, I tend to resist the categorization of 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 immigrant novel or immigrant literature because it seems so um, minimal. You know, like it's it's such a total way of trying to describe a narrative that is oftentimes trying to do so many other things. Migration being being one element of it, and the story does have you know one part of the narrative is about someone coming to America and, and finding a relationship and trying to reconstruct their life, but it's also so much more about how our our seemingly different lives um, have to eventually, or sometimes are forced to converge in different ways. And so the categorization of, of our stories is just one of migration, I think, um, leaves out the other half, that like we're not only leaving places, but we're coming to someplace new as well. And when we come to someplace new, we're sort of adopted or rejected into these societies. And so for me, what I'm always more curious about, rather than just one categorization or one definition of a narrative, it's very much about how people are managed or forced to sometimes come together and all the reasons and all the challenges that they face in order to do so so yeah it's like people use the word assimilation and it's funny because in your book it's almost the opposite you have these two incredibly different contextual relationships 
and yet they're very similar. And it's not like, okay, I'm gone from here where all these horrible things happen. Now I'm here and everything is different and I have to move myself into it. In fact, the two experiences, as, as you obviously meant them to be, the relationships, um, and this is what's so good for the reader because it makes the reader work, the two relationships have a great deal in common. They do. They do. They're, they very much echo one another. And, you know, while writing the novel, I realized, um, you know, it began very much with the story of these young men on a college campus in Africa and then quickly took on a second voice of the voice of Helen, the woman who narrates the parts of the novel that take place in the United States. And once those two narrative voices began to emerge, they quickly turned into a sort of conversation. So some of the things that were happening in Africa found their sort of mirror partner in the United States. So you can have a group of young men who are being beaten or discriminated against in a cafe in Kampala because of their poverty, because of the fact that they don't belong socioeconomically. And at the same time, you see a couple at a diner in the United States who are being discriminated against because of the color of their skin, because it's an interracial relationship that people are uncomfortable with. And it's one way of, of showing how we can mirror these, um, not only these, these experiences, but the politics that sort of surround them once you begin to to minute, once we get to localize them on the, in the space of a single individual or in the space of a couple. Yeah, it's funny because that scene in the restaurant is the first time you realize it. And, and this is why it shouldn't be pigeonholed. In the scene in the restaurant, you first realize, hey, Helen's got some issues, you know? She's... Yeah. <laughs> you kind of just... It goes, wait a minute. Is this... Well, why exactly is she doing... Anyway, so um, when I first see a book where it has alternating chapters, like you look at the table of contents and it's Helen, Isaac, Helen, Isaac, Helen, Isaac, Helen, Isaac for two pages, um, I get a little nervous and I go, oh, am yeah. I going to like this? How are the transitions going to be like? But then they... Even though the stories were so, so far apart, uh, it melded together really nicely and you actually... I felt very comfortable in the switch from one to another. In fact, sometimes you kind of fooled me. For example, when I switched from one Helen to Isaac, the first line of the new chapter is, when I woke the next morning, Isaac was standing over me, nudging me gently in the back with his yeah. foot. And I thought, wait a minute, this is supposed to be Isaac now. Why is that still Helen? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that was, um, I know that those. I would love to believe that all of that was, you know, sort of some part of a, of a master plot to, um, <laughs> to merge every single little detail together. But, but it, does, it did quite happen, I think, quite organically. You know, these, these characters were very much in conversation with one another. So something would happen in eyes and chapters of the novel, and then almost immediately afterwards, Helen would um, find a way of picking up that piece. You know, there would be a way in which suddenly her experiences were so closely embedded or attached to what had happened in the other part of this novel um, that it was almost inevitable that you would find echoes and traces of that in, in, in her life. And it's, and it's nice to sometimes ask a reader to, um, to pause and, and leap into another narrative voice and into another narrative space. You know, that sometimes works both as, as a challenge and also a sort of release. You know, so you, you occupy one space as deeply as you can and then at the same time, you can sort of hit pause and ask the reader or invite the reader to step into another world and say, like, you hopefully have engaged with this reality, with the sort of complex politics of, of a college campus in 1970 in Kampala. And now if you just, just, you know, continue that capacity of imagination, you can sort of move to a diner in the Midwest or to a small college town in the Midwest and still find yourself just as deeply attached and just as deeply connected to the experiences that are happening there even though neither experience may mirror your own, or perhaps one mirrors your own and the other one doesn't, nonetheless, when you force them together, when they sort of rub, rub alongside each other, um, they hopefully have you know, some compelling force for the reader that makes them feel very, very whole. Yeah, it's funny. But you know what I mean, though, right? In some novels where there's yeah. alternating chapters, you go, oh, wait a minute, yeah, I wanted to get back to her because, you know, I really... I want what's happening to her. Whereas in yours, since it, and it's kind of scary, I mean, in a way, because it flows so smoothly. And it's funny when you said, um, I think you said something about paper, but without giving anything away, you know, there's a piece of paper in this book. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's, okay, have I been formulating this in my head the entire time I've been reading this book? So it's really nice because there's really, you know, oh, there's, Three people, one being the reader involved, but then I forgot about Rose, and yeah. I read this. <laughs> I don't know if you read this one where they did a poll who was their favorite character, 
and six. No, I, I haven't seen that. Six percent picked Rose. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what it says about the novel, but I don't. <laughs> I, I yeah, I love Rose as a character, even though she's she's fairly um, on the sidelines for, for much of the novel. She does still serve, I think, a, a, a pretty critical function. Um, and even you know, within that that passage that you meant about. Helen writing down on a piece of paper when just before she goes into the diner with Isaac, um, we have every right to be here. You know, her, that small little gesture also has you know, a strong echo with what happens in, in that campus in Kampala, where the two narrators or the two young um, aspiring revolutionaries, you know, create this paper revolution where they're writing down the sort of absurdity of, or they're mocking the absurdity of the government's declarations of, of all the things that they can't do and shouldn't do as a way of asserting all the things that they should be able to do. And suddenly you find Helen, you know, saying, like, we have every right to be in this diner, even though they that may come with, with certain obstacles and certain challenges. That's funny. I just realized how much, how important paper and words on paper make a difference in this book. I just realized that. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that, ties, that ties in very closely to the, to how much the novel is also concerned about the, the the power of naming, you know, sort of the, the ability to, to declare what something is or is not, and um, and all the sort of authority that comes with that, and all the feats of imagination that are necessary to to be able to do that. So, it's you know, again, it's one of those things that you you hopefully find arriving organically in the novel, and that you know, as a writer, you you embed yourself in these ideas, and, and bit by bit, they begin to echo one another. So characters are, are constantly redefining and renaming themselves um, and sometimes they're doing so on paper and sometimes those words are being obliterated even as they try to do so. Yeah, it's funny because um, you talk about organic um, if you did, did you vet the cover? Did they give you several covers? Because covers fascinate me. Did you In, in, in this case, uh, they always let you vet the cover um, but as soon as the I mean, we tweaked this cover very, very very minimally um because the initial version was 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 wonderful um you know i love this cover it's um it's so sensitive to what the novel is and to so many of the themes that are that are that happen in the novel and to even specific moments inside of the novel that uh, the cover just sort of encapsulated more than i could have ever hoped for yeah it's like it's like a spoiler that i i can talk about because it's the first thing anybody sees you know yes yeah. It's, and what the cover is, because it, it, you know, some of you might not, not have seen it, is it's just the words, all our names, and it's just crossed through. And it, it's about what Denal is saying about names are very important, but at the same time, you can lose them. Sometimes you want to lose them. And, um, and you, know, you know, I have an independent bookstore, so everyone says you can't judge a book by its cover. But unfortunately, every, <laughs> single, every single person who comes in does judge yeah. every book by its cover. Yeah. And, and if we didn't judge books by the cover, we wouldn't care so much about the covers, I guess. I know. And also, even when you pick it up, the texture of the cover, somehow yeah. it manifests something, too. So whoever, yeah, you know, the, publishers must, you said, must know what they're doing. And the texture of that paper almost feels like, um, you know, when I first touched it, I thought immediately of the chalkboard. And yeah. that scene in the novel where the um, two young men are, are trying to write an imaginary formula for a bomb on this chalkboard and of course what they're writing is what, what they're writing is in marker and can't be erased but they know very they know as well that what they're writing makes no sense it's just pure gibberish it's, uh, it's an act of imagination an act of um, sort of wishful thinking that they're engaging in and the covers seem to seem to grab hold of that as well yeah it's cool because there's another basically paper piece of paper and it's really yeah. like a piece of paper because it isn't chalk so it's indelible that's pretty yeah. interesting you know, it's funny because the beginning, that portion seems so playful. You know, it's like two tiger cubs playing before they grow up. Yeah, um, yeah that's, it's, it was, it's really cool. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it's, it, they're, they're playing, um, you know, it's, it's, they're trying to, to engage in one last act of, of sort of almost delusion. You know, they want to hold on to some form of innocence, even though that innocence is definitely tinged with um, the sort of veneer of violence, but they also know that what's going to come next will be, or has the potential to be so much worse than what they've already gone through. And so, you know, this little pause that they have, this like this little playful back and forth um, is one way of kind of suspending a little bit of holding on to a little bit of innocence that they know is already kind of receding into the background. Yeah, I know. And it's like this kind of, I don't mean to put it, you know, to lower it, but it's like kind of this buddy movie film 
where there's one guy that has this tremendous amount of courage and a plum, uh, and yeah. the other guy's following him, and actually very closely given what happens, um, and doesn't necessarily live up to him, but kind you know kind of is there for him in a way. Sometimes yeah. yes, sometimes yeah, yeah. not. But yeah, no, definitely yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny though because in the interview on the Strand, the guy kept you kept talking about good revolutionaries and how you turn into a bad revolutionary. And it's really hard for me to think of that. Like you take Joseph, for example. He seems, and, and the key word is seems, to maybe be a good revolutionary. But it always boils down to, and I know it's a cliche, that power corrupts. And I mean, you or me or any other nice person, if you give them power or total power, you're going to be corrupted. It just happens. There, yeah. there doesn't seem to be any cure for it in my mind. Or do you disagree with that? Um, well, it's 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 when it's in, in Joseph's case, you know, the power does sort of corrupt. I mean, I think he he begins very much with the best intentions. He has, um, you know, he has a sort of profound frustration, as do many people do, with with the government that um, is, you know has, is running the country that he's a part of, and so he wants to to react against that, and he wants to to respond, I think, in the best possible way. But I think really quickly, what happens is that desire to to do something. Well, when it's when it's ensconced in violence, when violence becomes the dominant form of political expression, then violence will, will sort of overwhelm the narrative. You know, so it's possible to to have a desire for power as so long as that power exists within a context that can maintain some control over it. As long as there are, are institutions and and societal functions that will keep that power from going unchecked, and that can allow that power to do more than assert itself through through violent acts. And in this case, and with Joseph's case in particular, he's not left with, mother, which, with too many other choices. You know, like he can't go to a voting box, he can't run for for president um, in any viable way, and so he automatically resorts to the traditional form of of, of military actions and and the violence that comes with that. And then quickly, you know, that violence overwhelms him. I think that violence overwhelms the movement that he's trying to start, and all the characters then become. Um, perverted as a result of that. It's funny because in your interviews, both written and televised, you spend a lot of time talking about the concept of, I don't know, you seem almost frustrated about it, of the idea of checks and balances, how this could work if, and my point is that I don't know where the if comes from, you yeah. know? Especially in the situation you describe in your book, where is the if? Where, where is the, you know, the, where are you? You have a, you have a very thin skin of, of civilization, and once you break through it, even in the slightest way, um, it's very difficult to go back again. Whether it's Vietnam or Iraq or Rwanda or the Sudan or Syria or perhaps now the Ukraine, once someone pierces that thin skin of civilization. Anything is possible, and, and the things that destroy both the life of the they they destroy destroy both the life of the destroyer and the destroyed. Yeah, no, and and, and that's you know it's there, there are scenes that that I think are are directly related to that idea that um, when forced into difficult situations that the sort of yeah, that, as you said that thin skin of civilization can oftentimes sort of um, fragment and break and shatter and. You know, I think part of it is is what happens when when people are forced to feel like their lives are very precarious and unstable, and they have no other means of addressing that instability, that sense of sort of profound fear and anxiety that comes with not knowing what's going to happen next, and therefore seeing everything that comes to you and through you as as a threat. And when that begins to happen, you realize how fragile our communities, our societies, our our lives are because our instinct is to want to defend. And if we have no other means of doing so, if we have no other means of, of declaring our intent, of declaring our desire for something better, um, and I do believe you know that declaration is possible, and it's possible when you people have the ability to express themselves through language, through through their voices, through having a, an ability to say like, this is what we want, this is what we need, and know that those declarations are actually heard and reciprocated on the other side. I do think that is that is the only sort of tool and weapon that we have against. That fracturing of, of civil society, but in so many cases you see governments sort of restricting that ability. They they find ways of automatically muting that and taking that authority and taking that possibility away from their communities. And when you begin to do so, 
you know, violence is itself its own form of language. It's a form of communication. It's the most brute and base form of communication. But when there's nothing else left, that does tend to be the things that we turn to. Yeah, things we turn to that we never thought we would be able to in a million years. Yeah. That's and, and the thing is, there's a pivotal moment in the book when uh, let's see, our pro. Uh, let's see, how can I phrase this without spoiling it? When when our protagonist is told, um, if you do something, I'll make you a lieutenant. Yeah. And that's pivotal because it's not done. But at the same time, it's done almost in that playful sense that they enjoyed when they were pretending to be students. You know? Yeah. yeah. And when he says that, you know, he's at that point in time, you know, he's asking the narrator to engage in, in another form, in, in an act of violence that he knows he will not. Um, and saying that if he does so, he will be promoted. You know, there's a deep cynicism in that, like, he knows that what's happening is that this movement, this possible um, idealistic revolutionary uprising is now being corrupted by the violence, and suddenly the violence is the only form of power. So what will make him a lieutenant aren't, isn't the strength of his ideas or the fact that he has other, you know, things that he can offer, but what becomes the most important thing is his ability to pull trigger in that case. And the narrator, um, or Isaac in that situation, is very much aware of the fact that, like, that something has gone wrong here, something has become perverted and distorted, and now what we are becoming um, is rather than a group of revolutionary liberators, we're becoming a violent army. What's funny because um, I was just talking to one, the manager in our bookstore, and she had just finished reading *The Goldfinch*, which just won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. And she was telling me how she hated every single character in the book, but she thought the book was written in the most incredible language she's ever read, and she'll remember the names of the characters even though she hated them. And I said, "Well, don't you think the author, Donna Tartt, being so smart, knew that you might hate them?" and and and, and knew that you would be talking to someone about it and that you would remember these <laughs> characters. Don't you think she had that idea? And he goes, yeah, I guess maybe I did know that. Um, and so in you, your book, the same is true. I'll remember the names. Well, it's easy. There's only a couple. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, I'll remember the names, but there's no one really to hate, right? Well, I hope so, yeah. I mean, you know, in, in this case, the, the characters do... Um rather awful things, you know, but I think in, in, in some of the violent gestures that they make and in some, some, some of the naive gestures that aren't necessarily violent, but they still fail in many ways. You know, the characters are constantly disappointing um, each other and perhaps at times the reader. But, you know, I, in this particular case, I did want that disappointment and that frustration that might come with that to also be tinged with the sense that there's a, a more profound intent to do something good and sometimes that desire to do something good is is, um, is distorted or warped into the materialized way the characters want them to but they still are aspiring to something better um, and so you hopefully have this sense of you know these characters who are flawed but at the same time rather fragile um, and and you know rather idealistic at times as well well it's funny because you know you have those book club discussion questions at the end of your book which I don't really like, but again, publishers are smart, and that's why they put them there. Yeah. Um, but you know, this will that we have a couple of book clubs at our store. Plus, we host a bunch of them, and I know this will be one. And when it is, you're going. It's a perfect book for a book club because you're going to have half the people liking Joseph, liking yeah, and the other half are going to say, "What's how? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Look at what he did. How can you possibly like him?" Yeah, and then the other person is going to say, no, "But deep down, deep down, in so many ways, he was such a good person." Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I hope that's exactly what the, you know what the case is, especially with with a character like Joseph, who is, um, yeah. you know, oftentimes easily depicted as as just nothing more than than a, a violent man whose desire to power is the only sort of thing driving him. That underneath that, you still sense this, you know, this man is also capable of, of profound empathy and and love at the same time. So you, you tell that you have to forgive the violent gestures that he performs or the actions that he's responsible for, but that you have to see him in a more total light, that you can't just ascribe one um, one characterization to him, that you still have to let him exist in the space of, like, here's still somebody who has all the other traits of humanity that we respect and admire and, and think of when we think of, of, of full, complete human beings. And yet at the same time, he's also tinged with um, this, you know, aura of tragedy and violence. And so hopefully, you know, the, character, the readers will will have that frustrating challenge of realizing here are people that they both sort of 
are angry or disappointed or perhaps even despised, and yet at the same time, they can't reject them completely because to reject them completely um, is a little bit too easy of, of, a, of a thing to do. It's funny, too, because with regard to Joseph and a very important person in this book, there's this sub-subplot, almost a sub-rosa plot, um, and I kind of got lost in it in the beginning. What chose? How did you choose to add that certain element in the relationship? Or you mean the relationship between Joseph and and, yeah. uh, and um, it came it came really naturally. Um, you know, to some degree that you know Joseph is in love with this young man, and um, that has one way of echoing the relationship between Helen and this immigrant who comes to the United States, and the fact that their um, their relationship, their ability to perhaps find love with one another is undermined by this profound racial antagonism and discrimination in this community, and that that antagonism, that racial discrimination, does, you know, at its very base, it undermines the human dignity that both of these characters are, are, are you know, trying to, to fulfill by loving one another. And if you're going to reject them, um, then, you know, you can see the same thing happening with, with Joseph and, and Isaac. They are unable to... Um, to kind of complete or fulfill the fact that they are compassionate, that they care for one another, that they love one another. There's no language to describe that to each other. There's no way in which anybody can actually participate in that. And so that relationship happens very much in secret in the same way that Isaac's and relationship ha Isaac and Helen's relationship happens in secret um, because of the color of their skin. And that one happens because of the fact that they're both men. So, I, you know, you wanted to push these things together and say, like, you can't... Um, we can't accept one form of discrimination and permit the other, that both of them are, are, are ways of um, minimizing our, our, our dignity as human beings. Yeah, it's funny because the way you underscore that is in a moment when, when there is an embrace and you embrace someone so hard that it hurts. Yeah. And that's the only way you can express what that uh, eluct ineluctable feeling is, you know, that... Yeah. Yeah, and I've been in that situation because, you know, um, it's it's difficult. W women can't women can't be friends with one another. W women, uh, what is it? Women, never mind. Women have to be friends with one another because there can't be sex. And men can't be, uh, they can't be intimate with one another because there can't be sex. So it's yeah. like it, your relationship is stopped by societal norms. Well, it used to be stopped by exactly. societal norms. Um, yeah. So now we've kind of switched gears. If we go to America in the 70s, a non-segregated country, but still a bigoted, which still kind of is country, what is it that, that Isaac and Helen are trying to achieve in their unusual relationship? And, it, and, it, and why are they not both seeking exactly the same goals? Because they're not. Um, you know, I think you know Isaac and Helen. They have radically different backgrounds, and yet at the same time, they they share all these like strange things in common. You know, they are both um, Helen, maybe very deeply rooted to this small town in the Midwest, and yet she's also, I think, profoundly alienated from it. And suddenly, this man Isaac comes to town, and through him, she finds this um, this opening, this opportunity to to be more of who she really is. And yet, at the same time, because of the fact that Isaac is black and she's white, they're their relationships immediately at risk. It has to has to be sequestered, and so they begin to perform all the rituals of a relationship just by the fact that Helen is there to escort Isaac through his new life in America. And so even before they become a couple, they perform the gestures of a couple. They go shopping together. They um, go to the grocery store together, and so they they have a veneer of a public life as a couple again. At the same time. They know that they can't ever express those things publicly, and so it's only behind closed doors that they can begin to actually find some ways of, of you know, falling in love with each other. But that capacity to fall in love with each other, I think, is, um, you know, it's challenged not only by the fact of the discrimination that surrounds their society, but this anxiety that uh, both Isaac and Helen have about how can Isaac translate his experiences to her, you know, how can he actually um, let her know what he's gone through and what he's been through without scaring her or without throwing her off. And, and she has that same fear. You know, she wants to draw closer to this man 
and yet you can see that she's also a bit nervous of knowing what he's gone through because perhaps that will be so extreme or so radically different from her own life that she won't have the capacity to empathize. Yeah, it's funny too because in their relationship, Helen and Isaacs in America, it echoes sometimes in order to keep their relationship intact and in control, they exercise this humor and playfulness in order to keep it from becoming a critical mass, just as Isaac did in Africa. You know what I mean? Yeah. They have, there's a, yeah, the, go ahead. The, the, yeah, no, they, they find all sorts of ways of, of, um, of, of both drawing closer to one another, uh, drawing closer to each other and at the same time, um, not at the same time finding ways of avoiding having to do so you know those sort of jokes and, and the gestures that they do with those with those little bits of humor um you know it's one way of, of sharing an intimate moment at the same time it's also a way of of keeping them from having to say what's what's much harder to you know to point out or to acknowledge yeah, it's funny because i was talking to two people yesterday and um, the one woman says well i have to leave now and i said well, we don't really need you here to have an intelligent conversation. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's kind of a loving kind of friend. And that's the way yeah. my father was, too. It's like, you know, by him telling me I was a jackass for 20 years, it was basically it took me uh, therapy to figure out that he was telling me he loved me. <laughs> yeah. People do that because, um, I don't know, I guess they're frightened or something, you know. And also because, you know, we need to, we need, sometimes need to manage our emotions. Um, it's sometimes easier to, um, to to be a bit coy or to couch our emotions in um, in sardonic statements or in slightly humorous bits because to say things directly carries a risk of of not only expression but also of rejection and so we, we find ways of trying to let other people know that this is who we are, this is what we think, um, while at the same time preserving um, some private space for ourselves that can't they can't be rejected, that won't look at us askance if, if we say something that feels too intimate or too personal. And people feel each other out that way, and sometimes they feel each other out for 40 years. And yeah. Someone works with someone in the workplace, and there's this tension, and they say things, but they never, they never admit, no, they admit to themselves, but they never allow it to happen. And then some yeah. people break through at a moment, and once they break through, it becomes wonderful. Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah, it's, it's, and you know, going back to Rose, it's funny, because even though you flesh her out in only a few paragraphs, she is kind of like the oracle in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah she, she, she serves a very sort of like pivotal role where she becomes, um, you know, it's like through her that Helen is reminded of, of this sort of capacity to love and the fact that like, you know, this woman um, becomes the sort of guiding light for her that, you know, she's reminded that Rose... Um, benefited and was enriched by the fact that she had someone she cared about and loved deeply and as a result it inspires in Helen the desire to want the same yeah and she even tells them where to go geographically <laughs> exactly um, well so um, I, I mean I, I thoroughly enjoyed this what are, I, I really I, and I read this in one sitting and um, oh, thank you. And, and yeah and it's it's like I've said to some other authors too it's like Sometimes you'll go back and reread a paragraph, not because you didn't understand it the first time, but because it was so nice to read it the first time that you want to go back and read it again. Um, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. No, you're welcome. So, what's next? Are you going to continue to <laughs> Are you going to continue to explore what you've been exploring, or are you going to do a science fiction book? <laughs> um, I, you know, the the good thing right now, or the terrible thing, and I'm not sure which one it is. Um, is that I'm not really sure, you know, I've um, I've had these three, I've worked on three novels now, one after the other, and they've all been so closely related that I think now is a very nice time to um, to want to pause for a little bit and see what can happen next. Um, so I actually don't have a clear idea, but I, I do feel like it'll be different. Probably won't be completely sci-fi, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, there's a certain liberty that comes with, with having, you know, run through a series of obstacles that each novel has presented and now I feel like okay I can I can stop running for a second and see what's new in my life what are my new priorities and, and the new things that I want to explore as a writer well not to sound presumptuous but it seems like during this process you yourself have undergone a certain sea change you know yeah definitely I, you know I think I've, I've all of my work has I think um, you know helped ground me profoundly and has given me um, 
you know, a sense of, I don't want to say completion, but it's, it's you know, I've worked through a lot of my own family's trajectory, my own sort of political concerns, my own experiences as a writer through these books, and now, um, and now you want to see what you have next in you, you know? Yeah, and I know in some of your interviews you, you've told how your journalism, which I haven't even touched upon, but your journalism has kind of informed this whole process in a way. Yeah, no, my, the, the journalism work I've done as a journalist has, has managed to creep its way back in, so there's sure. always been scenes and images um, from from my experiences as a journalist that have found their way of having a second life in my fiction. That's been, it's been really rewarding. Well... Uh, then now it's been a pleasure talking to you. Our book, your book, is sitting on our front table. Uh, several copies of it. And people have been buying it, and hopefully after this. Uh, and as I said, as I want to tell everybody, um, when we when we listen to this broadcast, it's it, it's going to be available on uh, our YouTube channel actually now, and on iTunes. You just have to type Denal's name in, either first or last, since it's an unusual name, and uh, and the name of the book, and you'll be able to listen to. Uh, unfortunately, me butt in and interrupt repeatedly. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, thanks again. And uh, hopefully, we'll, if you're ever in the Philadelphia area, just come by the bookstore and we'd love to see you. It would be a pleasure to. Thank you so much for the conversation. You're welcome. Oh, okay, I'm doing the whole thing? Okay. All right. Next week on The Avid Reader, we'll be talking with B. Ridgway, author of The River of No Return. River of No Return is a time travel book with a bunch of swashbuckling uh uh, battles and it creates uh, a real romantic feeling as well. So it combines three genres, but it really is a good time travel book, and I love those kinds of books. And B will be appearing at our store on Thursday, May 8th at 7 p.m. to sign, read, uh, questions, whatever. Um, you know where we are by now, just uh, across from the Downingtown interchange of the Turnpike in the Eagle View community. Just follow the purple signs uh, to the retail shops, and we're right above the restaurant Brickside. And as I've said, uh, we're now on uh, not only WCAG, but Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, our YouTube channel. And so I thought, although my manager is going to be upset, if you come in and tell us that you've listened to this interview uh, um, next week with B, and if you've listened to it on WCAG or Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest, and you can prove it to me, then the first five of you, I'll give a free signed uh, copy of uh, off, um, River of No Return. So I just thought of that. So in the following week, with regard to B. Ridgeway, our book club will be meeting, meeting on two separate days. The 14th, um, which is a Wednesday in the afternoon between 2 and 4, and the following Thursday, because we have so many members now, uh, which is our evening session, and that'll be the 15th from 7 to 9 in the evening. So come in, join our book club. It's a great book to start with. Um, it's got lots of things to talk about, and people will have different opinions about what happened in the book and what's going to happen in the sequel, because there will be one. We... Uh, we provide cookies, coffee, other kinds of goodies. And um, so come by and see us. And uh, look forward to talking to you next week. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.